There's suffering. And then there's man-cold suffering. Perhaps you are unaware of this condition, so let me tell you. Strangely enough, when two people, a man, one man and one woman, are infected with the same disease, the dreaded rhinovirus, which is better known as the common cold, you have two totally different outcomes. The woman, she doesn't feel great, but she gets on with her day. But the poor man is struck down with the dreaded man cold. His eyes are watering, his nose is running, he, he has, he's running a fever, and it seems as if he might not recover. The only hope that the man has is to retreat to his bed until all the symptoms go away. Now, the man cold, you may be wondering, where have I heard about this before? Why, where is there evidence about this? It, it, to be fair, it baffles the medical community. They don't know why it is that women can seem to carry on with this dreaded cold. But we poor men are struck down with this this man cold. It, there's no suffering quite like getting a man cold. Well, except for actual suffering, like real pain, like childbirth. Yeah, I think that would count. And, and actual diseases that actually do debilitate people and leave them in chronic pain or, or the kind of suffering that changes your, your whole quality of life. It rips away your livelihood and forces you to be cared for by others. It changes the way you live and act and walk as we see in the example of our gospel lesson from Mark chapter 7. Here we have the story of a man who was deaf and who was nearly mute. He almost couldn't talk at all. Did he have suffering? Yeah. But what does God have to say about it? What does Jesus do about our suffering? This is a question that, that all of us think about at times because the reality is that for all the people sitting here, there are people in this room who suffer real physical chronic pain all the time. And if you're not one of those, someday you might be. Because this, the odds are that, that many of us will suffer at one point in our life, sometimes in difficult, debilitating, painful ways. Into this, our Savior Jesus rolls up his sleeves to get down and dirty and to deal with real suffering as we hear in our story from Mark 7. Let's take a look at it now. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could barely talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. So here we have this poor man who is physically suffering because he cannot hear. Physically suffering and emotionally suffering, I am sure. Can you imagine being in his shoes? All the sounds that you hear, the voice of your loved ones, totally silent, totally isolating, totally alone. How could he even communicate with the people whom he loved the most? And when words came out of his mouth, his loved ones perhaps tried their best to understand, but maybe couldn't always. And the people in the village who saw him snickered and laughed at him because of the way he talked and sounded. Yes, without a doubt, this man was suffering. And it's no wonder why his friends brought him to Jesus in the story. And this is how we tend to think about suffering, isn't it? 
that when we're suffering, what do we do with it? Well, we take it to God. We take the pain that we have, whatever it might be, and we want to lay it before God and beg Him to take away our suffering. How often when we pray to God, and I guess I have to include myself in this as well, do we not only come to God in prayer when we are, in fact, suffering, and we want God to take our suffering away? Because that, after all, is what we want when we're suffering, that it would be taken away. We come to Him in prayer, Lord, take my pain away. Take away the pain of my child. Take away the pain that my parents are going through. And, as we look at this story, it might seem as if that's exactly when we should come to God because Jesus comes to heal this man. We continue on with our story. At verse 33, look what happens. After Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. So Jesus takes this man aside, touches his ears, touches his tongue, looks up to heaven and speaks an amazing word, Ephatha, be opened. And just like that, the man's healed. Jesus healed him. So Jesus will heal you. God doesn't want us to suffer because suffering is bad. Healing is good. Amen, right? Hardly. Because we all see there's a glaring question here that comes out of this. If the solution to our suffering is that God would heal us the way that Jesus healed that man, well, what happens if he doesn't? What happens if your suffering, in spite of all your prayers, remains? Or gets worse? Or that the quality of life you thought you had goes away even more? What then? Those are questions that all of us ask. And those questions are probably questions that this man asked as well. I mean, because, let's be honest, he's a person just like us. We hate suffering. He hated suffering as well. And I bet when he was thinking about it, he probably, first of all, was grateful that he could hear again, but later on might have had some questions. You know what? If God has the power to heal suffering in the way that Jesus healed me, well, why didn't he just stop me from having, uh, being deaf in the first place? If God has the power to stop me from suffering and cure all diseases like Jesus does, why doesn't God cure me? Why doesn't he help my loved one? Why doesn't he take away the pain that my child is, that, is suffering from that I feel helpless to do anything about? See, this raises almost more questions than answers. Even though Jesus healed the man. It's good for him, but for every deaf person that Jesus healed and every lame person that walked again, there were probably a hundred or a thousand others who didn't receive a miraculous healing. And so we ask these questions. But these questions that we ask of God, they lead down a dark path, don't they? They lead us to start to doubt God, to doubt His power, that He can do anything, to doubt His love for us, that He really is merciful and cares about our suffering. Even to walk away from our faith altogether. I'm sure that this deaf man, as he pondered what happened to him later on, and as he thought about his experience, Perhaps he came back to some of the first words that his newly healed ears heard. The reaction of all the people 
as they saw what happened here. Verse 37 in our text tells us this. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Jesus has done everything well. Think about that for a minute. Think about that as you see how Jesus takes this this deaf man aside from the crowd to have a moment when all of his undivided attention is on that man. Think about that as you see how Jesus touches the man's ears as if to say, I know that you can't speak plainly, but God has heard your cry and I am here to help you. Or the way that Jesus spits on his fingers and touches the man's tongue as if to tell him, I'm going to do something for you that is amazing. To address the the suffering that you are going through right now. And then the way that Jesus looks up to heaven so that that man would most certainly understand that Jesus was telling him, All that is about to happen is by the power of God. And then the almost inaudible sigh. Ephatha. And instantly the man's ears are opened and he hears for the first time. And he understands. As if he'd been speaking and hearing and understanding language his whole life. He didn't need to learn anything. Jesus gave it to him. He has done everything well. If perhaps by some modern miracle of surgery, a deaf person regained their hearing, they would still have to learn to speak as if they were a child, not understanding sounds the way you and I do. But not for this man. Jesus did everything well. And when the people were confessing, he has done everything well, they were saying much more than perhaps they even realized. Jesus had come into our world to do everything well. He has done everything well, and he continues to do everything well. In fact... That's what Jesus does. He does everything well to the point where there is nothing that Jesus could do to improve upon what he's already done. That means that the way that Jesus healed this man and the way that he knows about your own suffering or that of your loved one, he's done it well. And that the way Jesus came down into our world, not just to observe suffering and say, oh, that's too bad, but like I said, to roll up his sleeves and to suffer the greatest, the most of anyone of all time by taking all of our suffering, all of our sin, all of our doubt, all of our despair upon himself and taking it to the cross. You see, as Christians, when we, when we look at the cross and then see the empty tomb a few days later, we understand something about how God, how Jesus deals with our suffering. He went to the cross to end suffering. And when he said from the cross, it is finished, he put a limit to how much any one of us can possibly have to suffer in this life. And he put a limit on how we would suffer for all time by saying instead with his empty tomb, you too, because I live, you too shall live. And by living, we will be without any suffering, any band-aids, any owies, as our kids told us today. Jesus has done everything well. But I suppose there's another application to saying this, that Jesus has done everything well. And that includes the way that he also has made us. Because God knows when he formed us and created us and made us, 
what we would have to suffer. What kinds of things God would put into our lives physically or into the lives of our family members. He knew all of this. And yet he still says, he's done everything well. We, we actually hear the way God did this in a psalm, Psalm 139, that talks about how God made us and formed us with all of his love and attention. One verse of that psalm, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has done everything well in making us, even if that means he gives us chronic suffering or pain or says that we'll have to go through cancer or that we wake up in a hospital bed with tubes coming out of us someday. He's done everything well. I find inspiration in the way other Christians have lived through suffering. And a good example of that was on the internet this week, a Christian woman named Gianna Jensen, who testified before the U.S. Congress because when she was born, her mom actually tried to have her aborted 38 years ago. And as a result of that procedure, her brain was damaged and she has spent her whole life fighting a cerebral palsy. And in addition to that, a new condition that she doesn't even know, but describes as horrible, that affects her every day. And this woman lives in pain. There's no question. And yet, she, as she testified before the authorities in the United States and millions of people, she wouldn't trade it for the world because her cerebral palsy and her other sufferings, in her words, are her sermon on earth. That through what she has suffered, she has been an inspiration to, to thousands of others and been able to comfort them in their own suffering and most importantly, to give glory to God. We might ask, how can she feel this way? How can we look at suffering the way that she does? I think the answer is simply trusting Jesus has done everything well. That when he gives us suffering and we know that it's from him, it changes our attitude about things because we're not so quick to judge and say that it must be bad in every way. In fact, it's through suffering that God has accomplished the greatest good. Jesus has accomplished the greatest good for us because he went through suffering. Because he was willing to suffer all things for you. To take away your ultimate suffering and open heaven to you. We might suffer. And we might suffer a long time in this world. But the value of seeing Jesus, who's gone through this and come out the other side, is it gives us hope. And it helps us to see in the midst of our own troubles that God doesn't give us pointless suffering. He accomplishes good through it. When an Olympic athlete wants to win the gold, especially in maybe an endurance sport, they have to be willing to punish themselves, to suffer in order to achieve victory. And they're willing to put their body through that kind of suffering day in and day out because they think that the gold medal will be so worth it. If people are willing to suffer for a medal, how much more for us who realize that what we receive through suffering is eternal life? That God works through us to glorify himself, perhaps through our suffering to call someone else to faith who doesn't know, but sees the way that you suffer and is amazed. We may not be able to see or understand all the ways that God works good through suffering, but we see in this example, in, Luke, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus accomplishing the greatest good through that man's suffering. 
Because by that miracle recorded and now read by thousands, millions, even billions of people, we see our gracious Savior at work coming down into our world to address our real problem of suffering. To the point where you and I are able to say, as strange as it might sound to our ears, Jesus makes suffering good. These weeks during fall, we're considering how Jesus is a timeless trendsetter. How he takes traditional wisdom and he flips it around and helps us see suffering and things like that in a whole new way. He helps us to understand a deeper meaning to life because we can see in our own suffering that God uses to work good. Then what else can God do, can't he? So as you consider how you walk through life, and what you may be called upon by your Savior to suffer in His name, as painful as it might be and as difficult as it might be, keep in mind that God sent Jesus not to laugh at you as if you had a man cold, but to be there right with you and to get you through that suffering to the gates of heaven and eternal life. Amen.